Hello and welcome to this very special episode of the Athletic Football Podcast as we react to Chelsea's shock sacking of Thomas Tuchel uh, and with us uh, for the show, the Athletic's David Ornstein and our Chelsea correspondent Liam Toomey. David, let's start with you. You broke it. How quickly has all this moved? Well, I think it's been moving, Mark, behind the scenes quicker than any of us knew uh, because this was not a decision that was taken on the basis of last night's results against Dinamo Zagreb. Uh, the decision had already been made and it feels like, it sounds like it was um, a little while in the making. You could even trace the warning signs and alarm bells back to Chelsea's pre-season when senior people there seem to have felt that Tuchel was acting uh, in a detached way, that the focus wasn't there in the way that they expected it to be. They've crunched the numbers and looked at the trends of goals scored, goals conceded um, in their first 50 days of ownership compared to their second 50 days of ownership, for example. Um, they've looked at his demeanour, his behaviour, his connection with the players. Um, they appear to have taken soundings and feedback from the dressing room. Um, and this feels like it was broken from the ownership's perspective. Um, and once they felt that, they didn't see the reason to hang around. It would be better to make the call sooner rather than later. Um, they didn't feel he was developing... Uh, senior players, let alone younger players that, you know, you would more commonly hear about development around. But uh, players who were on the fringes were not feeling connected and integrated. Um, take Christian Pulisic, for example, or Timo Werner, um, Romelu Lukaku, both of whom have left. Um, and yeah, it's unraveled in a, in a shock way to us, in a spectacular way to the, the wider public, but maybe not internally. Um, it seems that Thomas Tuchel was not the man for this ownership. Um, they were looking at things, they are looking at things on a five, ten year projection. And if you're feeling these things now, is that the right way to be continuing? Is that how you wish to go on? They clearly felt no. And so they have decided to pull the rug from beneath his feet. And the uh, process to appoint a successor uh, is already, by the sounds of it, underway. Are you shocked, Liam? It's been quite a morning. Um, <laughs> I, Hang on, I we think... should just reiterate: you you are the Chelsea correspondent for the Athletic, and therefore I would imagine nothing really shocks you. Nothing shocks me. Plenty surprises me, and Chelsea keeps surprising me. Um, there's a there's a contrast here, I think, with the the Frank Lampard sacking, and of course the the, the way we. The way we covered that, as opposed to the way this story is breaking now, I think, you know, with that sort of situation, we had very solid information three or four weeks in advance that the process to replace the coach was was in motion, um, and we were able to record, report accordingly what the situation was. In this case, as as David says, you know, it's I think it's been moving much quicker behind the scenes than we were aware we we did hear things over the summer to suggest that you know th things behind the scenes weren't great um but we didn't have a sense that we would reach this point right now i i went into the season honestly it's not something you say without very solid information i went into the season thinking we might end up here at some stage um but i didn't think it would be now this is an incredible an incredible decision to make uh, five days after the close of the transfer window. The, the timing invites a lot of questions. Well, I mean, a, a penny for Pierre-Emerick Aubameyang's thoughts hmm. this morning. Yeah, I mean, one of the key reasons he agreed to join Chelsea from Barcelona was because of the presence of Thomas Tuchel, his coach from Borussia Dortmund, and their relationship, which has continued and been very healthy since. Um one of the key reasons that Tuchel uh, wanted to sign Aubameyang was because of his guarantee of goals and the trust that they have. I was starting to hear about tension in recent weeks, actually pretty much since the USA tour around recruitment and Tuchel's ideas versus uh, the ownership's ideas and whether they were quite on the same page. Take the Cristiano Ronaldo pursuit or interest 
for example, that was something that Todd Bowley and the ownership were willing to explore uh, when it was raised, uh, along with his representative, George Mendez. And it seems Tuchel, um, very publicly, even though he didn't say it on the record, um, was revealed to be uh, against it. Um, and he spoke publicly about, you know, taking on responsibilities that normally a coach wouldn't have to during this transition from the Abramovich to the Bowley Clear Lake ownership. And so I guess those schisms were starting to form. And you can't say it journalistically at the time, but this week people were saying to me, maybe the international break for Tuchel if it continues this way, or maybe the World Cup, um, or they'll do it in the international break and, and so that they can really get working over the course of the World Cup. It was being intimated to me that Tuchel's time was limited. But you suspect, given how fresh the ownership is, that that may have just been a bit of emotional thought that had got through to certain contacts and sources and and they'll win a few matches and they would ride the storm. He's a Champions League winning coach who they inherited. Um, but it seems that it was very real and they've wasted no time. And that point about a Champions League winning coach, you know, Chelsea felt that he would have the sort of emotional intelligence to really bring this squad on, to work with the players who were on the sidelines, out of favour, out of form, um, bring the younger players through, um, collaborate with the, the most experienced heads, the mature characters in that dressing room to get this sort of show on the road. And, and that hasn't happened. We're hearing today that the communication had really been very slim at best with those senior players. Um, that the messages were not coming through that, you know, look at his, uh, movement on the touchline last night, a lot of sitting on the bench, complaints coming through in his press conferences. Um, I don't think the Chelsea hierarchy felt that Thomas Tuchel was in it with everything he had anymore. And therefore, if he wasn't, and they had their reservations, it's best to part. Be fair to say, Liam, the football hasn't been brilliant towards, towards the back end of last season and the start of this. I mean, you know, we're doing this and they're sick. They've only they've lost two away games in the league and they, they had an opening defeat in the in the champion on Tuesday night. Football hasn't been brilliant. But there will be those close to Thomas Tuchel, I'm guessing, supporters of Thomas Tuchel going, hang on a minute, look at what the guy has had to cope with since I mean this calendar year, basically. So Whilst David makes the point on communication and, you know, maybe, you know, a bit flat and a bit surly or whatever it may be, there'll be people going, well, hellfire. Can you can you blame him? <laughs> yeah. I mean, to give you a little peek behind the curtain before we got wind of this this morning, um, my initial plan today was to write a piece on the numbers underlining why Chelsea is so boring to watch. <laughs> <laughs> so it, it's been something that Chelsea fans have been talking about. I think it's arguable that they've never been a particularly thrilling team under Tuchel. Um, their best moments came because they were arguably the best defensive team in Europe and one of the best pressing teams. But the other point you make is, is completely right. I mean, I, I don't think any coach has had to face as much off the field as Thomas Tuchel has um, in the second half of his Chelsea tenure with everything that happened at the end of the Abramovich era, the amount that he, the, the kind of questions he was asked to field publicly, um, the sort of lack of leadership at the top of cl the club towards the end that he was expected to fill. And then of course, over the summer um, with no football structure above him, once, once Marina Granovskaya and Petr Cech departed, the, the, the strain of, of having more, a little bit more input into into transfer targets. Now, the other interesting thing about this, is obviously a lot of Chelsea fans are saying, why did we give him a transfer window only to sack him five days afterwards? I was being told the whole time from an ownership perspective, they were making club signings. Tuchel was having input into that. And I think that's probably most pronounced when you look at a deal like a Bamiyang. 
Um, is Aubameyang a club it, signing then, Liam? I think that's probably the the hardest one to argue. I think that was that was clearly yeah. that that was clearly the most geared around what Tuchel needed immediately. Sorry, yeah, Doug. I think we've got to return quite rightly to that Aubameyang signing because don't forget when he wanted a three year deal and Chelsea only wanted to give him two years with the option of a third based on percentage of appearances made, which is how it has ended up. The reason he wanted that third was to replicate the security he had at Barcelona in case there was a change in manager and the new person did not see him as their type of player and flavour of the month. And he encounters a similar situation to what he's uh, experienced at Arsenal. So fascinating talking point. However, to your question, um, Todd Bowley and you know other members of the hierarchy were told were in favour of this Aubameyang signing very heavily um, as one of the um, foremost goal scorers in European football, despite being 33 years of age now, proven track record in domestic and, and European competition, fired Barcelona into the Champions League, crucially for them for this season, um, and was available on the market given the circumstances at Barcelona. Um, there was resistance. We hear that uh, Bedad Egbali, one of the partners of um, Todd Bowley, was more cautious than some of the others, um, and that Thomas Tuchel wanted Pierre and Aubameyang as his first choice uh, acquisition. But I think it would be a bit disingenuous of us to say that it was not one that the hierarchy were pursuing, because significant members of that hierarchy definitely were. Yeah, I think um, I think you can make an argument that Aubameyang makes pragmatic sense, regardless of whether Tuchel's the coach, based on what the squad needed, based on what the existing problems were, scoring goals. Um, but it does invite questions, as we say about the timing of this. If um, if if we go back to what you said, David, about after the American tour that there were concerns. Why didn't they just do this before the start of the season? Yeah, I think it's fair to um, give a manager of Thomas Tuchel's repute time. Um, and they are brand new owners who have never owned within football, let alone the Premier League before. Um, they were fresh into the club. They had already moved on Bruce Buck, Marina Granovskaya, Petr Cech, now Scott McLaughlin has decided to leave too. So all of the old guard pretty much has gone. Um, chief executive, I think as well, Liam Wright. So the, the entire previous regime is out. And Thomas Tuchel is the Champions League winning coach, um, very popular among fans. And, and we thought players on the whole too, is perhaps the one to maintain the stability for that transition period. Todd Bowley suddenly found himself as co-owner, chairman, acting sporting director. Um, they didn't have a, a sporting director of experience within football. Um, and so for continuity reasons and to give him a chance and the benefit of the doubt, um, then I think it was probably fair to retain him at that point in time with everything the new regime were dealing with. An appointment process for a new head coach would have probably been the last thing that they wanted to do. And there was a feeling after that Arsenal pre-season match that although it wasn't good, stay calm and it's only pre-season. Um, I was hearing after that that his demeanour was causing concern. However, they opened the season up with, with a win. Um, and I think their final preseason game gave cause for encouragement. And therefore, in those really delicate moments, they probably felt it was the right thing to do to let him guide them forward for the time being. But they would have then expected a positive trajectory on all of those concerns and it's been a negative one and things appear to have spiraled out of control in their eyes um they're seeing a negative trend on and off the pitch 
um, they feel in his demeanor, demeanor and behavior, he's had um, personal issues to deal with, which have been played out in a very high profile and public manner. And in the end, it appears to be irreparable from their perspective. I hope you're enjoying this uh, live show certainly more than the dogs on view. Our minds left the room and Liam's has just gone for a sleep on the settee behind him. So I don't know if that's a, a comment on on what we're discussing. Uh, da- David's point about the summer, though, Liam, still stands, doesn't it? I mean, at least in the signing of the players, they had Thomas Tuchel to bounce off, Right. A new owner who is also the sort of interim sporting director and all of the other expertise that have left Chelsea, you're not going to bounce your new manager suggestion off the manager fired, are you? So where where are they going to look? Yeah, I mean, I, I, I was told, you know, when we were putting together our big transfer window read, which, which ran a few days ago, um, that Chelsea's recruitment was a conversation over the summer and Thomas Tuchel was one of the the voices in that conversation but the new owners also leaned heavily on the scouting network which of course at that time was still led by Scott McLaughlin and the data operation that was already at Chelsea um, in the course of making their player assessment so it it, it wasn't as Tuchel led um, as some might have you believe Um, and and certainly that's that's really the only argument that the owners can make now because you you've dispensed with the coach that you that oversaw these signings anyway um the the other point based on what david was saying there is that best practice in these situations generally would be to hire a sporting director and then have that person have input into who the next coach is it doesn't look like chelsea are going to be able to do that now because we're being told that you know, a new a new appointment of Tuchel's replacement will be sooner rather than later. Um, and I don't think a sporting director will be in place by then. So you're talking about then hiring a lead football executive above whoever the new coach is, who is inheriting that coach. Um, and that that feels like something that could could also be a complicating factor down the line. Um, the other thing here is before we come on to the names, Liam, is Their transfer policy this summer appears to, and I appreciate players can be shuffled around, but appears to indicate a willingness to play a 3-4-3 or 3-5-2. You know, the two centre-halves to play either side of Thiago Silva. Cucurella signed who is a left wing back, but could play as the left, or as we kept being told, on the left of a a back three. Aspilicueta kept... You know, who again could play two roles. Rhys James, new six-year deal. Of course, that's that's common sense to anybody. But the way the transfers have gone appear to have been bought for a style that Thomas Tuchel was playing. So when they're looking at all their options, are they looking for someone who 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 will want three at the back because of the makeup of that squad? I think it's a very interesting question. Um we know Graham Potter's played three at the back at Brighton quite a bit um, last season, of course, with Mark Kukurea in his team. Um, I think you have to look at the sheer number of defenders they signed over the summer as an indication that three at the back with wing backs possibly makes most sense now because if you switch to a four, there's a lot of rotation that will need to happen to keep all of those guys happy, um, even over the course of a long season. But I think... The counter argument you would get if you if you ask Chelsea's owners would be that these players that have been bought because they're top players that can play in different systems, different positions. Kukurea, I think, has has said himself that his best position is left back in a four. Um, and of course, Wesley Fofana played a lot in the middle of a back four at, at Leicester. So I think they're they're backing the the signings to not be limiting factors in who they pick next. It's very interesting that when Roman Abramovich hired and fired, we used to get a lot of um, information or speculation uh, reports that uh, players had been consulted, the likes of John Terry, Petr Cech, Frank Lampard, Didier Drogba, senior members of that dressing room. I'm just looking at messages as we're recording this and being led to believe that the players didn't know that this was 
coming that the decision had been made. They obviously flew back last night. They weren't in Cobham for training at the time that the announcement was made and that they were not directly consulted on this decision. Um, they seem to have taken soundings from what they've picked up from senior players and dressing rooms over a period of time and then made their decision unilaterally. Um, and it's quite extraordinary. You're talking about the, the tactical side of things there as well, that Todd Bowley seems to be leading this front and centre, as we've been saying with recruitment or something summer, now with decisions, uh, maybe with the appointment of the, the next manager too. Maybe he has some sounding boards that we don't know about. Um, we hear that Bedadeg Bali is picking up um, football intelligence and connections very quickly. Um, uh, but it's... <laughs> It seems pretty high stakes, and um, and the, the, there's no uh, question about where the responsibility for this decision lies, and and who is uh, rolling up their sleeves and and taking authority and uh, responsibility. It's uh, Todd Bowley and and that brand new hierarchy, and that appears to transcend from transfers to managerial change, perhaps to the influence over that manager, and therefore the formation that you speak about. Who wants to go first on this then? Should Brighton fans be worried? <sighs> what do you They've think, David? Enough, uh, Chelsea and uh, Brighton have had quite some summer, haven't they? Cooker let me, let me just Paul. read you. Let me just read you what Guillaume Balaguer, the the, the mm. journalist, has tweeted. Chelsea, and this was this is in the last five minutes. Okay, this is according to Guillaume. Chelsea have asked to talk to Potter. He has a sixteen million pound buyout clause. Uh, they prefer harmony uh, and results. They like Graham Potter, uh, and that was and that's his. The new ownership wants to get rid of anything. Abramovich was the other thing in that tweet. That that would make him pretty much Chelsea's cheapest signing of the new since the takeover. <laughs> yeah, um, is that would he? Do you think he'd be their number one target? It's difficult. I mean, it, it's so out of the blue. It might be difficult to say, really. It's difficult to say, but given the the timing of all of this and 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 the fact that it's being strongly suggested to us that Chelsea want to make an appointment very quickly um, with the next few games in mind, that suggests they have a clear first choice um, in their heads. And and if that information is correct, obviously we're we're doing our own work to try and establish that at the moment. Um, then yeah, maybe Brighton do have reason to be worried. This is a live stream at the moment, so I can't work out whether David just pretended he'd got a message on his phone so he didn't have to answer the Graham Potter question. No, I just wanted to make a few calls on, on that subject. Um, uh, look, Chelsea want to make an appointment as quickly as possible, and they hope that that could happen before the next game, which I think is the lunchtime kickoff against Fulham in, in just a few days' time. Um, yet they also say that there's nobody waiting in the wings and an interim coaching staff will be in place for the next few days. Uh, that taps into what Liam says. They appear to have their eye on who they want to appoint and they're ready to do what it will take to get that person in. Um, Graham Potter is admired by all of the big clubs to varying degrees and no doubt the Football Association as well. And Brighton will fight hard to keep hold of him. He's very happy there. It would be expensive to get him out, as Tottenham found last summer. But I think they might have done it uh, the way their managerial merry-go-round was going. But in the end, he decided to stay. Um, he will need to be convinced, if indeed he is the key target, that this project is right for him. He won't just jump into it because it's a great opportunity. Um, no, because we keep such... saying, David, David, yeah. we keep saying on every podcast that we do on Brighton, every show on Brighton, that Brighton are well structured from the very mm. top to the very bottom, right? Yeah. So, and and this is when Graham Potter has been linked with other clubs. You know, he has he's just lost a, a sporting director in Dan Ashworth at Brighton, obviously. But chief exec, how how they recruit, their forward planning, everything that is the complete opposite at the moment to the situation at Chelsea. And Graham Potter, knowing Gra you know, having interviewed Graham Potter a few times and how he thinks and how he operates. All of that will be going on in his mind. It won't just be, oh, there's a, there's a big club that's coming in for me. Great, Champions League. There's a lot more to it with Graham. 
Yeah, and and remember when they were struggling for results at Brighton a while ago and goals and the fans were getting a bit anxious and vocal and he had a pop at them, didn't he? And it's quite relatively straightforward to weather those sorts of storms. Um, if you're a good coach like him with such a great setup and many good players at somewhere like Brighton, just playing domestic football, um, come to Chelsea and you're in the Champions League immediately. You've lost your first group stage game. Um, you've got the expectation of new owners whose ambitions, with all due respect to Tony Bloom, um, Chelsea want to be winning, expecting to winning, win the biggest trophies in world football. They're a Goliath by comparison in you know, football history and also revenue generating. And by the way, I've got the utmost respect for Brighton. I always say to people, if you were to strip away the the, the history, the colours of the kits, the name of the club, um, and just look at the way all of these clubs operate, then Brighton would be in the top four and they would probably be above most of um, the so-called biggest clubs and certainly Chelsea at the moment. Um, and so Graham's got an amazing setup there. The people around him, the control, the authority, the expectation levels, the recruitment, the analytics, um, a really strong contract. Um, and it will take something major uh, to influence him to move to Chelsea if indeed they decide to. Uh, Pochettino's being mentioned, I'm just looking now as well. Zidane, you know, familiar names. I I understand the Pochettino one and his level of expectation, but also when I asked a few people on that recently in relation to Chelsea, I got quite a, I wouldn't say cold response, but cool and cautious. Um, uh, and so, yeah, I mean, credible reporters are saying that Potter is the chosen candidate or the first choice or um, at, among the top candidates. Um, don't forget that Brighton and Chelsea have had some quite interesting dealings with each other this summer over Mark Cucurella, um, where uh, that price that Brighton were asking uh, of Chelsea caused quite a lot of unrest. There was then that social media spat they, they had. Yeah. Levi Colwell Will went in the opposite direction. And I'm trying to wrap my brains Billy into Gilmore. another... Bill, Billy, Billy Gilmore. Billy Gilmore. Yeah, that was the one. Thank you. So Billy Gilmore on deadline day, um, or coming into deadline day, was had a deal lined up to join Brighton, and Chelsea's owners were not playing ball for a number of days. They didn't want to let it happen as a result of the way things had gone during the Cucurella transfer saga. In the end, it happened, and, and everybody saw sense. Um, and, you know, <laughs> um, I think uh, Brighton's hierarchy, whether it was Tony Bloom or Paul Barber, would have been among those that um, attended the dinner that Todd Bowley hosted after one of the shareholder meetings in London. And I think Paul Barber was on the radio recently um, talking about Todd Bowley on the record, saying that he was really impressed by him. He negotiated well. Um, so th th there are lines of communication there open already. And and. You know, meanwhile, Pochettino's out of work. Zidane may be more difficult if that's a credible option because of his English and, and his inclination to this point doesn't seem to have been the Premier League. And there may be some others in the frame too. But just going back to the point that Chelsea are making about hoping to get somebody in possibly for the next game, you think this is uh, clearly a case of them having their eye on someone specific. We're going to end up with a situation where Tottenham have Antonio Conte and Chelsea have Maurizio Pochettino, <laughs> Liam. Cool. Well, I've seen a, a serious that, point. That's a lot. There's a long read coming, isn't there? Goodness me. A serious point that I'd throw to Liam is that the fans that I've seen on social media, quite prominent um, accounts, seem to be very against the idea of Pochettino, uh, presumably because of the Tottenham link, quite vociferously. So I don't know how... Um, both the, the dismissal of Tuchel and the next appointment are going to play out with the fan base. Yeah, I think there was a range of opinions on Tuchel by the end um, within the, the Chelsea fan base. With Pochettino, obviously you have the Tottenham factor. I think those of a Chelsea persuasion would have been less inclined to view his trophyless reign at Spurs um, as favourably as a lot of other people did, you know, people who recognise how much he overachieved there. And I think the his tenure at PSG 
um, raises questions as well, because particularly when you're projecting forward as to how he might, you know, succeed or fail at Chelsea. Okay, Chelsea don't have Kylian Mbappe or Neymar or Lionel Messi, but there are top players with, you know, who've won big trophies and and, ha and ha have big belief in themselves. And could he communicate with a group like that? Could he get them to commit to his style of football? That would be a question of Potter as well, of course, who hasn't managed at this level yet. Um, there's always in these situations, Brendan Rodgers comes into the frame. And when you speak to people around football, it, it was... What? Um, Blimey, at the moment? No, no, no. Just, no, just hear me out. Sorry. Um, All right, okay. The, <laughs> that... Um, when you speak to people around Chelsea, they would say that the previous regime would not have taken him, even at, when his stock was sure. at its highest. Um, I don't know if there were some issues in the way that he departed his previous role. Well, he Chelsea. said, da David, he, do you remember the quote that he said of, I'm trying to build a career, not, a dis not destroy one, when he was at Swansea yeah. and linked with Chelsea? I think that didn't go down well. But with this regime having changed and how highly he has been regarded, I know that some at Arsenal wanted to appoint him when they went for Unai Emery. And then when he won the FA Cup, those same people were sort of like, told you so, um, behind the scenes. Um, obviously, his stock uh, has fallen somewhat. He's having a very difficult time, at least I'm not suggesting that he would be in the frame this time. I just wonder if things had um, gone better for him now that the regime has changed, whether he might have been in the frame. But yeah, I guess that's a bit pointless right now. Apologies. A very quick final one, and this may be slightly left field. There's there's no way they would be patient at all and say, wait for Deschamps after a World Cup, for example. Liam? I suppose ah. the circumstances demand one sooner than that. I was just thinking about his church connections and his record and actually somebody who at the end of the World Cup, I don't, I don't know if he said he's going to leave France, but he might want to move on. Yeah, and Zidane seems to be waiting for that job, doesn't he? Um, mm. So I, I I mean, he, he, he has the resume to make a case that he, he could coach Chelsea or another top club in Europe. I just can't get away from everything we're hearing saying that they want a much quicker appointment than that, that the time frame just won't allow for this. And I think the last thing the owners want to do now is to allow the season to drift. You know, the, the Premier League table still looks OK. It's a bad start in the Champions League, but perfectly recoverable. Um, I think if they're if they're uncertain now and any sort of interim um structure doesn't get the results that that Chelsea need they could be in a much bigger hole and also in a more difficult spot to try and recruit someone good David Liam thank you good work uh thank you very much for watching and listening and obviously you can follow every stage of the developments and uh plenty of long reads on whoever the new man will be from Liam and David uh, on the athletic thanks for watching and listening